Why are Asians like myself called yellow when we're not? While it's easy to dismiss such a descriptor as simply racist, that doesn't really answer the question satisfyingly on an academic level. So today in this video, we're going to discuss the history behind the origin of why some Asians are described as yellow. Now before we start, a very important thing to understand is that how you and I look at race, skin color, or even ethnicity today is wildly different from how people barely a century ago looked at such concepts and theirs even more different to those from say a thousand years ago. Indeed, even today's perspectives and thoughts on things like skin color are still changing. Just to give an example about whiteness as a color, did you know that the US Census Bureau director in 1936 concluded that Mexicans were white or Caucasian, when today many would think they are Latino or Hispanic or brown or in some cases describe themselves as white Hispanic. Weirdly enough, depending on the area, some Chinese American children were allowed to attend white only schools during segregation due to some legal precedents set in the late 19th century. The definition of whiteness and the benefits of what that meant due to politics, citizenship legalities, uh, labor disputes, potential application of Jim Crow laws, and other cultural factors often change in the United States for certain groups like the Irish, Italians, and even Finnish immigrants who you would think are white. Now, when we look at Chinese literature, like Romance of the Three Kingdoms, uh, we see some characters described as fair or white, and when we read accounts from Jesuit missionaries such as uh, Alessandro Valignano, Gaspar Bellella, and Louis Fra, we have descriptions of the Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans that describe them as pale or white, with some comments on aspects of their civilizations that they deemed as advanced as what they saw back in Europe. Now, the skin color here is, again, descriptions of appearance not necessarily how we think of ethnicity or skin color today. So how did we go from white to yellow? There's a lot of points in history we can look at here, but a good point to look at is the development of European sciences and disciplines, and to no fault of their own, just like us humans today, People wanted to understand the world around them, they wanted to better easily understand and classify things, see how they or humanity fit into the universe or nature, sometimes framing such attempts in the religious context and sometimes not. This was a big thing during the Age of Enlightenment from the 17th to 18th centuries. One such person who sought answers was Carl Linnaeus, a Swedish biologist whom you may have learned about in your science classes as the father of modern taxonomy. This guy was an absolute rock star amongst intellectuals and nobility, and he had a passion for what he did, namely zoology, the study of animals. Carl Linnaeus had a hot take in his work Systema Naturae, which was that humans are part of nature, and not lords of nature, as the Abrahamic God declared. In fact, he was one of the first scientists to classify humans as anthropomorpha, or later, primates. He would then classify humanity or homo sapiens into four different varieties associated with the four known continents, different climates, and what's called the four temperaments. These four categories ultimately were Europaeus albus, Americanus rubicens, Africanus niger, and Asiaticus fuscus. Funnily enough, Linnaeus would later change Asiaticus fuscus, which meant tawny, and by tawny I guess he meant dark or a sort of brownish to uh, Asiaticus luridus, which can mean yellowish, drab yellow, or pale yellow. Again, Linnaeus used these as descriptions that he drew correlations to certain traits at times, which one could look at as racist, but he did not determine these classifications as separate human races. But of course, just like any other idea, his were taken and ran in many different directions by other naturalists and scientists and other uh, intellectuals at the time. It's not until Johann Friedrich Blumenbach in the late 18th and 19th century that we see an even bigger narrowing down of different groups of humans. Blumenbach was a German anthropologist who, like Linnaeus before him, pursued the understanding of humanity and he did so by examining the biodiversity or difference in humans by comparing skin color and yeah, skull anatomy, which would help develop the field of craniometry and in turn feed into the more racist pseudoscience of phrenology. Blumenbach established a system called the Generis Humani Varietes Kine Principes, or the five principal varieties of humankind, but one species, uh, in which he classified humans in the categories of the Mongolian, American, Caucasian, 
Malayan and Ethiopian races. It's going to be a bit confusing, but Blumenbach grouped Europeans, Middle Easterners, and South Asians into the category of Caucasians or the white race. Southeast Asians and Pacific Islanders were put under the Malayan or brown race. Demographics including Sub-Saharan Africans were put under the Ethiopian or black race, and Native Americans were put under the American or red race. Finally, Blumenbach grouped all East Asians under the Mongolian or the yellow category, and this is where we get the obsolete term mongoloid from, which implies to some historians a sort of callback or fear of the Mongol invasions, but we'll get to that later. The following is going to be perhaps contradictory, but Blumenbach was apparently not trying to be racist or establish a strict racial hierarchy with Caucasians at the top, stating things like, I am of the opinion that after all these numerous instances I have brought together of Negroes of capacity, it would not be difficult to mention entire well-known provinces of Europe from out of which you would not easily expect to obtain offhand such good authors, poets, philosophers, and correspondents of the Perry Academy. And on the other hand, there is no so-called savage nation known under the sun which has so much distinguished itself by such examples of perfectibility and original capacity for scientific culture and thereby attached itself so closely to the most civilized nations of the earth as as a Negro. But Blumenbach did believe that every race outside of the Caucasian or white category was a degenerative form of the primeval Caucasians, meaning that the others developed how they did due to ways of living differently, different diets, and of course living in different climates compared to those who were still Caucasian by his time. Interestingly, he believed that over a long period of time, if it was ever attempted in controlled environments, everyone else of these races could eventually return to being Caucasian, and even if he did not intend to do so, his work concerning the categorization of humanity Humanity would contribute to the rise of scientific racism. So at this point, we have these ideas from Linnaeus and Blumenbach seeping into the rest of society. Popular thoughts and growing fields of sciences often permeated their way as well to the higher classes of European societies, and then the rest of the population, as these thoughts and ideas developed or changed for the better, or in this case, worse. Of course, eventually these ideas became more racialized rapidly, and government approved as colonialism and the need to justify said colonial expansions and other policies became necessary. And since a lot of the justification for forcibly assimilating or brutalizing different regions of the world during the 19th to 20th centuries lost in showing how much better it is culturally, economically, and politically under white rule, you needed ways to other or dehumanize other groups, hence the yellow for Asians stuck, especially when there was resistance to these efforts in the cases of China and Japan, because if they're white, in the eyes of some anthropologists and those who adhere to these beliefs, you're just as good, but yellow sort of denotes, well, you're not as bad as black or brown, but you're still not as good as us. And of course, xenophobia, economic concerns, and political concerns grew in Europe and the United States towards the end of the 19th century regarding the so-called Oriental or Yellow Race, which became a sort of boogeyman as industrialization rapidly changed so many things at every level of society and made things feel uncertain for so many people. We have the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and the subsequent Geary Act, which for the first time in U.S. history, banned and halted naturalization of immigrants based on ethnicity alone due to anti-Chinese sentiments over labor and a whole plethora of perceived issues and violent incidents committed against Chinese immigrants. On a side note, a lot of the legislation here happened under President Chester A. Arthur, who ironically perceived himself as progressive because he decided to carry out a cultural genocide rather than the physical genocide of Native Americans, just to give you an idea of the state of things back then. And I shit you not, purportedly, German Emperor Wilhelm or Wilhelm II had a dream in 1895 where he saw Buddha sitting on a thunder dragon invading Europe as shown by this drawing, which was used as a propaganda piece to urge colonization of China by European powers, and this of course contributed to what's called the Yellow Peril, or Yellow Terror, Yellow Menace, or Yellow Spectre, coined by a Russian sociologist to depict Asians as some sort of existential threat 
to the Western world, and of course, yellow as a descriptor for Asians became more common in everyday vocabulary. Academic Orientalists or artists in Europe would also express how every European needed to band together and prepare for this yellow threat, with some saying there would be a second Mongolian invasion. Some intellectuals would even urge radical social changes such as the elimination of monogamy so white people could breed more than the Great Yellow Danger. The fear-mongering was so real, some even believed that a conflict between the yellow and white races was inevitable, and indeed Darwinian, and that Christian civilization hung in the balance if something wasn't done. How very convenient, especially for the ruling classes at this time, to focus a lot of the public's frustrations and anger as a result of massive social and economic upheavals on a yellow other. It also doesn't help that yellow as a color could be associated at that time with things like jaundice or sickness, and before anyone suggests that the phrase yellow-bellied could be related to these topics we're discussing, I believe scholars still don't know where exactly that phrase comes from at this point in time. It doesn't seem at all related to what this video is covering. Now, once we hit World War II, things don't really get any better as propaganda against Imperial Japan would often depict the Japanese as, well, yellow, among other things, so it just stuck given how prevalent stereotypical depictions of Asians in media were during and after World War II. It's just quite amusing, at least to me right now, that yellow face is an actual term we all accept that defines non-East Asians using makeup to mimic East Asian characteristics, which just goes to show how deeply embedded the notion of yellow still is in our subconscious when it concerns Asians, despite the obvious problematic. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you'd like me to cover next as a historian. I just made this video because I thought it was interesting or would be an interesting topic. If you want to see more history content in your future, definitely subscribe to do so and to also support me. See you guys next time.